the life and legacy of Bob Hawke. He was the Prime Minister who let it all hang out. He could laugh with joy over national success in a yacht race. I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up the day is a bum. <laughs> he was not embarrassed to shed tears for a drug addicted daughter. You don't cease to be uh, a husband. You don't, you don't cease to be a father. Or to weep for the victims of Beijing's Tiananmen Square massacre. Anti personnel characters, uh, carriers and tanks then ran backwards and forwards over the bodies of the slain. Robert James Lee Hawke was no plastic politician. His emotions, his flaws, his virtues and his vices were there for all to see. I've made no attempt to hide my character. Before he entered Parliament, especially in his years as head of the trade union movement, Bob Hawke drank and swore and womanised with a recklessness just about unprecedented in public life. Many Australians liked the larrikin image, but it became clear, including to the man himself, that the lifestyle, especially the dependence on alcohol, was incompatible with his political ambitions. So in May 1980, five months before contesting and winning the seat of wills in Victoria, he announced he was giving up the grog. I could never have been Prime Minister if I hadn't made the decision. Not a drop passed his lips for the next 13 years. And reporting on him for every one of those years, Nines Laurie Oaks. Mr Hawke transformed himself. It wasn't just about going on the wagon. He dressed better, improved his grooming, cleaned up his language, changed his whole approach to life. In short, he turned himself into the kind of person he thought a Prime Minister should be. It was an amazing study in self-discipline. Australia's 23rd Prime Minister was born on December 9, 1929, in Border Town, South Australia. The son of Clem, a congregational minister, and Ellie, a schoolteacher. The family moved to Perth 10 years later. In 1953, Bob graduated in law from the University of Western Australia and went to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, there setting his famous speed drinking record. A yard of beer in 11 seconds. He never lost the skill. He and Hazel Masterton married in 1956. They had three children, Susan, Stephen, and Roslyn. A fourth, Robert Jr., died in early infancy. Mr. Hawke conceded in a 1981 interview that life with a nationally known boozer and ladies man had not been easy for Hazel. Uh, often there are women around and uh, stories around. He went to work for the Australian Council of Trade Unions in 1958, became president in 1969 and built public recognition and popularity through the resolution of industrial disputes. The industrial peacemaker reputation gave credibility to his consensus approach when he made the switch to parliamentary politics. I've said for a long time that if I went into uh, Parliament, uh, being the sort of person I am and thinking that I have certain capacities, I would uh, try for the top position. He got to the top after a close challenge, followed by months of undermining and pressure, which saw Bill Hayden bow out as Labor leader. On the very day, Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser called the 1983 election. <laughs> By any measure, Mr Hawke was a successful Prime Minister. Not only because he won four elections, but also because he led a government with the guts to tackle such tough reforms as floating the Australian dollar, deregulating the financial system, introducing fringe benefits and capital gains taxes, and privatising government enterprises, including the Commonwealth Bank. Treasurer Paul Keating helped power the reformist drive. But it was made politically achievable by Mr Hawke's consensus approach, his feel for what the electorate would tolerate, and an extraordinary popularity level through much of his prime ministership. He spoke emotionally of that in 1990. I just love Australia and I, and I love Australians. I mean, I, I love them passionately and um, and for a fair bit of the time, and a lot of them, they, they, they've reciprocated, not uh, with a constancy, um, the measure changes, but 
I think we're still basically good mates. The Hawke government was unmistakably Labor. It restored Gough Whitlam's universal health insurance scheme, abolished by the coalition, boosted payments for low-income households and gave unions an economic policy role through a prices and incomes accord. But the former ACTU president was also comfortable rubbing shoulders with the big end of town. His view of his purpose as Prime Minister was simple. Creating the greatest amount of happiness and prosperity and security that you can for your country. That's what, that's what your responsibility is. Economic setbacks, though, gradually eroded some of the hawk gloss. 17% mortgage rates, followed by a slump and rising unemployment. This is a recession that Australia had to have. Also, Mr Hawke's relationship with an ambitious treasurer wanting a turn in the top job deteriorated. In late 1988, they signed a secret pact at Kirribilli House in which the PM promised a leadership handover after the 1990 election if Labor won. It did win, but Mr Hawke reneged on the agreement, sparking an unsuccessful Keating challenge in June 1991. The fact is I had only uh, one shot in the locker and I fired it. No, he didn't. A second shot six months later brought down Labor's longest serving Prime Minister. Paul Keating uh, polled five votes ahead of Bob Hawke, 56 to 51. But with Hazel and his daughters there for support, the ousted PM told a final news conference that pride outweighed the hurt. Australia is now a more uh, outward looking, uh, more tolerant and more competitive uh, country than it was when I came to office. Even his political opponents didn't dispute that. And when he left Government House, after handing in his resignation that night, ordinary Aussies crowded the drive to show their appreciation. Thank you for the wonderful team of 11 years. Thank you. Australia you, Bob. Congratulations, sir. We owe you, Bob. In the last three years of his Prime Ministership, Mr Hawke had resumed a clandestine affair with his biographer, former journalist Blanche de Pluget. Once his political career ended, so did the need for discretion. This is a new life, a new love. He and Hazel divorced in 1995. Marriage to Ms. de Pluget followed. Hey, good, 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 His good. love for the Labour movement, however, remained constant. And when it seemed he had almost faded from view. Come, I won't sing Matilda with me. Mr. Hawke, former PM, simply became Hawkey. Champion Sculler, champion of the people. And the great man Bobby Hawke nailed it. Said thank you very much, boys. Cheers them. Loves his cricket. Have your cup back. Don't waste the drop. For his 88th year, a beer brewed in his honour. 88. Yeah, 88. It's a beautiful number, isn't it? Good Chinese number. And Bob Hawke knew how he wanted to be remembered. A well, trade union leader who perhaps had sufficient common sense and intelligence to uh, tone down his larrikinism to some extent and behave in a way that a Prime Minister should if he's going to be a proper representative of his, of his people, but who in the end is essentially uh, a dinky die Australian. He's still got the capability of a beer skull. <laughs> Good on him. Mark Burrows, Nine News. Job Paul Keating has tonight paid tribute to the man who, with him, helped reshape Australia. Here is a little of that statement. With Bob Hawke's passing today, the great partnership I enjoyed with him passes too. A partnership we forge with the Australian people. But what remains and what will endure for the, from that partnership are the monumental foundations of modern Australia. In what was our last collaboration, Bob and I were delighted to support Bill Shorten last week in recounting the rationale we employed in opening Australia to the world. Bob, of course, was hoping for a Labor victory this weekend. His friends, too, were hoping he would see this. And that photo there of Bob Hawke and Paul Keating sitting down to tea together was taken just over a week ago. It was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. Talking of the Sydney Morning Herald, the front page of tomorrow's SMH under the headline, The Fearless Reformer. It features the unmistakable face of Bob Hawke in his latter years, aged but never bowed.
And that concludes our special broadcast on the death of Australia's 23rd Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. The Australian flag will fly at half-mast on all government buildings tomorrow, here and overseas. And no doubt come the Sydney Cricket Test in the new year where Bob Hawke used to raise a glass to the crowd. This time, the crowd will raise a glass to the memory of Bob Hawke. Good night. I'll sing Matilda, I'll sing Matilda, you'll come a will sing Matilda with me. And he sang as he watched and waited till he did he was. You'll come a will sing Matilda with me. Up came a jumper to drink at the Billy Bong. Up jumped the swagman and grabbed him with glee. And he sang as he shot that jumbuck in his tucker bag. You come a will sing Matilda with me. Oh, I'll sing Matilda. I'll sing Matilda. You come a will sing Matilda with me. And he sang as he was that jumbuck in his tucker bag. Ha! jumped the swagman and jumped into the billabong you'll never take me alive said he and his ghost may be heard as you pass by the billabong you come all sing matilda with me all sing matilda all sing matilda You'll come a will sing Matilda And his ghost may be heard As you pass by the billabong You'll come a will sing Matilda With me